You don't see the Thornburgs here today, other than Jordan. Thanks very much. <laughs> Sorry, other than Jordan and Eric. I am, I am actually thinking about your brother's family. And they, I, I just want you to know that our hearts are, are heavy uh, for the loss in the family. Um, they will be jumping in their cars and going to a, a difficult service, um, not knowing what to expect, uh, not knowing uh, how people will react. So I just want to want you to be in prayer today, uh, please. Uh, it is it is a difficult thing, family. Uh, sometimes when uh, when you have friends over, you feel actually closer to your friends than you do to your family. Family is sometimes a difficult thing to to get around, and uh, we're going to pray for Ginger today, particularly as she negotiates the politics in her family. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing too. Uh, as a nation, we are once again in, in mourning for what happened in Florida this week. And I didn't want us to go, to go by this Sabbath without the opportunity of raising our voices corporately to the Father in heaven who, who knows what's going on and maybe, maybe he will be gracious to us and let us know how it is that we can relate to this growing trend. Uh, it's tough. It's really, really tough. I'm an immigrant to this country. So, well, uh, Eric says, so say we all, except if you're a full-blood Native American. And uh, I don't know if anyone is today, but if you are, congratulations. And this country stands for freedom in so many ways. Freedom to be just whoever you think you want to be. But what is very fast becoming the case is that that just doesn't sit well with most of us that I'm not so sure that I'm interested in you being all that you want to be if that involves taking the lives of your fellow Americans. So as, as, we, as we move and have our being in this place, just know that uh, uh, I and you, I hope all of us, will be in search of a solution as God-fearing Americans that we would be looking for a way of helping our neighbors when they need help. Um, I did watch a number of things yesterday about this, and one man was, was very pointed about the fact that we should speak up. I'm going to say, yes, that's true, we should speak up, but then I'm going to ask you to also be willing to enter into people's lives to ask God for, your, for courage that when you see someone who is in trouble and you know that they are in trouble, that you choose to get involved. I actually asked when I came to California whether the Good Samaritan law exists in this state. Because in some states people you help can actually turn around and sue you. And so there are many people who say, oh, I don't want to get involved. It's going to be too complicated. I want you to know I, I fight with myself on this in many instances, and, and I say to myself, is that going to be wise to get involved? And we do need wisdom in this. And so I ask God to say yes or no about these things because he is my leader. And he is the one who I would like to see exalted in my community in these United States. I want people to know that there is a God who loves them and who accepts them no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, and that 
he is interested in them uh, and that he loves them. Uh, it's funny because I come from South Africa. So I'm on the list. I'm on the list right now of being born in a, in a country that might not measure up in some people's minds. Okay? And um, I worry about my country. I worry that, that they won't have the wisdom to, to, to live the life that they want to live. And so I wish good things for them. I, w- I want good things for them. I, w- I was talking to, to, to Pedro this morning and I asked him one question. I said, Pedro, what kind of world? What, what, what do you want for your kids? What, what, do, what do you want for your, your kids growing up? And he said, I, I, I want a safe place for them to grow up and be able to be anything they want to be. Okay. Well, I'm going to agree with Mrs. Clinton. It's going to take all of us. In this town and in every other town, it's going to take all of us pulling together and saying, this is the kind of community we want. Come be part of us. But it means that, you know, we're going to take care of you and you're going to take care of us. We can be that. And, and I know this sounds political to be saying this today. But we can be that in this community in the name of Jesus. For his sake and for his kingdom's sake. And the reason I'm talking like this is because today we are talking. Jordan and I are going to have a little chat here. We're going to tell you what we've been thinking and maybe it will stir your pure minds as to what you're thinking because two men did what Moses did That's why I had that scripture read. You might think, why did he read Exodus about the fact that Moses wanted to see God's face? Is not that what we want for ourselves and our children? We want them to see God's face. We want them to see God in us. And so two men go to church. They want to see God's face. But they have very, very different attitudes about God and about themselves. So that's where we begin. (laughs) It's it's a tough it's a tough beginning. I did I didn't know that Florida would happen this week. Did you? No. I mean, and and here and and here we are. So kind of the one of the first things we talked about was Jesus. Jesus tells this parable and. um, We, we, we see two different guys coming to church. Talk to me, Jordan, about the word honesty. Well, I, uh, I was actually saying it to a few people this morning. This is one that I was really excited to dig into. Um, kind of in the way that you look forward to jumping into a cold pool. Like, you're not really looking forward to it, <laughs> but it's going to wake you up. And I told Terry, this is one that keeps me honest. Because um, you see two people who walk in there on the surface with two, you know, very similar purposes. But the honesty is examining why they're there. So if they were to look within themselves and be honest and say, where's my focus? Is my focus on the people around me and the performance that I'm putting on? Or is my focus on, you know, God? It's, there's a, almost an equation uh, here where it comes down to, you know, how your focus is divided. There's, mm-hmm. you know, trying to, to get right with God, but also looking good while you're doing it. Um, and I know I kind of fall guilty with that sometimes because I, I take stock. I donate my extra change to the children's hospital at Panda Express. They ring the bell. They say, thank you. I walk out of there feeling pretty good. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy to tally up where I think I'm doing well. And you hope that people see that because you kind of subconsciously want the validation Okay, but uh, but he they they came to church, and so you you've got to admit that they they were he, they were also looking. Both these guys, I guess, we're talking mostly about the Pharisee right now. He's looking for validation from God to sure, sure. Right. And we had spoken about how uh, the validation that he might have been seeking could come from a place of feeling like you don't measure up 
you know, mm-hmm. in, in a deep center of yourself where you are being honest with yourself and maybe you really want to be validated in the things that you're doing because the, the Pharisaic life as I understood it or understand it was not easy. No. There were a lot of stipulations, a lot of things, a lot of metal boxes you had to strap to your forehead. <laughs> it was it was a lot to do and you would hope that going through all that work would, would get uh, some kind of affirmation. To me, it, it this guy believed that if he did all the right things, that God was going to check all the boxes and and basically pronounce, give give him the well done, give him give give him the give him the well done, and that by doing so he could go home saying, I thought this about myself before I came. Now I really believe that it's true because. God said so. Right. Yeah. And the focus is on his own works. Right. Um, and I know that's kind of a broad thing to go into uh, faith-based grace or works-based grace, but the attitude suggests that these two men were coming at it from kind of those different ways. You have one who's saying, I know I've been doing, I've been checking off my list. I've been paying attention to it. I've been working on it. You know, I'm pretty sure I'm good. I've, I've, I'm pretty sure I've done enough to at least get an A minus on this thing. Mm-hmm. And the other guy, you know, comes in there with the exact opposite. Well, he's a tax collector. And, right. and just right. a quick review, um, ra- ra- raise your hand if you, if you already knew that tax collectors had to buy the right to be a tax collector from the Roman government. If you already knew that, raise your hand. Okay, so those who didn't raise their hand, this is news to you. There was a lottery in some respects. <laughs> so, so not only was he looked at as a, a traitor to his country for working with the Romans, but he hadn't just been picked by the Romans and forced to do it. He had gone to the auction where they sold the right. <laughs> Can you imagine? They sold the right to be a tax collector because they knew that the tax collectors would uh, take a little more than just what the Romans required, and that that is how they would make their living, basically ripping off their own people for themselves. So now you know why tax collectors were hated. They were hated for two reasons. One, you didn't have to do this. You wanted to do this. You wanted to work with the enemy. And two, You are ripping us off. We know that you're ripping us off, but we can't do a blessed thing about it because you've got a Roman soldier standing next to you who is going to make me do anything you say even though I know you're ripping me off. So now you know why Zacchaeus didn't want to go in that crowd to see Jesus. Somebody was going to slip him something between his ribs because they didn't care for him and they hoped he would die. So Jesus, in his, <laughs> in his typical manner, decides to tell a story that is going to get the attention of the people that are listening to the story in such a big way that he's going to contrast the literally the people, the person he, that people think is the very best of them with the person they think is the very worst kind of person. So that's how he sets the story up. So please please understand that that I, I wanted to tell you that because I want you to have the opportunity to do the same kind of thinking in your mind. Think about the very best kind of person who loves God and think about a person in that same community and then do the thinking that Jordan just asked you to do. That we always do anyway. Which one am I? Okay. Here's what I'm going to say about the Pharisee. And I said this to Jordan. Jordan, uh, remind me if I say this right. Mm. 
What if the Pharisee was actually really scared underneath? Really scared that people would find out who he really was. Yeah, I, it goes back to uh, what we were talking about earlier this week, where I think when your buy-in for for spirituality and religion is to you know hold on with a clenched fist to some idea of self-preservation, that changes the whole context of it, and you are monitoring your performance and you're hoping that you measure up so that you make the grade because it's it's now a survival instinct you know Mm -hmm. if you're if you've got that kind of fear it means you might not have a great understanding of the love that comes in that relationship that should be there Mm -hmm. um and it's it's once again presuming to do the work of god for yourself because you're hoping that you can save yourself and you can be a more active agent in your salvation than you're supposed to be which, which led me to say to Jordan this week uh, something that I'd never really thought about the Pharisee before. Um, his picture of God, um, suddenly it, it, it dawned upon me, he doesn't really think that much about God. I mean, God's not, A, that important. All he is really there for is to check the box of something that I have done. Okay, so here's where I'm going to mess with you just a little bit, okay? And if you are that little old lady, please forgive me. The little old lady comes to me afterwards and says, Pastor, I haven't been to church for three weeks. I'm so sorry. What is she needing at that moment? Assurance. Assurance, validation, she was a Catholic, and, and I'm, I'm happy for this, this part of the Catholic Church because there is a need for someone to say, it's going to be okay. Isn't that what she's looking for the pastor to say? Sister, that's okay. So then I think to myself, well, why do I, why do I come to church? Is my coming to church because... I'm worried that God won't check my box. He, he won't say, oh, good guy, he went to church. Am I worried about that? Uh, I wonder. It's an easy trap for me to fall into, uh-huh. um, especially when you're a part of a, a community where this, this whole thing is almost cultural. You know, if you're Seventh-day Adventist, you have all these little in-words, you know, you can talk about Ellen White, you can talk about Haystacks, you can talk about mm-hmm. Oshkosh. People are going to be aware of what you're talking about. And with that kind of culture comes the question that maybe people don't ask out loud, but how good of an Adventist are you? Do you have your carob in the pantry? Do you, you know, only drink Roma? What's your, what's your level of buy-in? And, and if, if you don't know any of the words that he just said, I want you to know this is the church for you. Yeah. Because because we're really working very hard not to use those words. Yeah, sorry, sorry to bring them out. Of the <laughs> when I when I when I think of Oshkosh, I think of jeans. Do you do you think of jeans, little kids' clothes? You know, Oshkosh, bagosh. Yeah, I hope I hope that's what you think. But there is that kind of fear yeah. that you're you're looking around because you feel like people are going to be watching you and paying attention and kind of grading you, mm-hmm. and you also feel. Um, or at least I have felt at times where my focus hasn't been aligned, um, that, yeah, I feel like God's going to ding me points if I'm not doing everything just right. And, and you know, that's a, that's a scary thing when you're in kind of a legalistic place because the world reinforces legalistic kind of models all around. They, we don't, I, the biggest struggle I had in accepting, you know, grace as it is is that there's no real true model like it in the real world that we no. practice. No. Um, it's a very foreign thing. And you get graded on everything you say and do. Right. Mm-hmm. And so this, for me, ties into what we were talking about, how much courage it takes to be uh, in the position of the publican in this story, mm-hmm. where you really have to strip away all the defenses you have that you hold up to say, I am a good person. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, tr- I'm doing my best. You have to just... So, so he'd obviously done an inventory. Mm-hmm. He'd done a personal inventory, which we will be inviting you to do as well. He'd done a personal inventory, and he could not find one good thing about himself. 
not that it was good enough to satisfy the. You know. Okay, so he uses he uses the word sinner. So if I say to you, uh, uh, "You're a sinner," I'm a sinner. You're probably going to say, "But, but, 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 I'm not a sinner, and and pastor, you shouldn't be a sinner." <laughs> What are we paying you for? Man? Yeah, what are we paying you for? Yeah, come on. Okay, you, you're the guy who's who's supposed to have this hotline to heaven, and 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 you're saying that, that that you're a sinner. This comes down again to this relational aspect, which I don't want us to lose sight of. And and you you've used the word focus, and and that's so important here. <laughs> How we think about God, what kind of relationship we want to have with God is shown in these moments when we do these personal inventory type things and we say, what's good about me? And we realize the things we might think are good about ourselves actually are not that helpful to our relationship with God. And that's painful. That is really painful. He comes in there, the Bible says, he's beating on his He's, you know, did you, have, have you seen this in the Olympics? You've definitely seen it in, in uh, uh, sports, this new thing, this new beating on the chest thing, like, you know, I, I'm number one. You, know, so, well, you so are I don't, so I, ready for the youth, man. That's I, awesome. I <laughs> love that. Okay. Uh, what is that? So we hear that this guy comes into church and he's, oh, you know, I, I think it's like his chest is caving in. He, he's done the personal inventory. He is coming to God with nothing. I got nothing. Yeah. And the, the caution that I think we both kind of reached an agreement on is we don't want the message to be you should just walk around with a whip and constantly beat mm. yourself up mm. for how inadequate you are. Mm. But I think that going back to that honesty thing, I can say for myself that however much polish I put on what I do, <laughs> it's not going to be good enough to you know move myself beyond my condition alone. Mm. Um, and the, the reassurance for me is going back to last week talking about how the guy who can make it all right thinks that I'm a treasure. Just like my grandma and my mama thinks I'm a treasure, I'm worth something. You know, for in, in that regard, I am enough. Um, we are all enough. We're all worth that love and that buy-in from him. Mm -hmm. But um, when the focus is on the actions that we're able to take, then it becomes kind of a different ball game in my mind, um, and it's one that I'm not very good at playing. So, mm -hmm. it also it also again uh, I'm I'm struck with the fact that it it diminishes it diminishes God it 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 makes our need we we literally don't need God. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing fine myself. I, I really don't need you, God. Um, really, again, I, I just need you to, I just need you to check the boxes. The example that comes to my mind is the difference between a teacher who's really invested in your growth versus the teacher they place out in the library to monitor you while you're taking your standardized tests. You know, that, that maybe that's a generational thing, but some of you guys are young enough to know that when it's that kind of thing, they just sit there and watch you fill in bubbles and take it from you when you're done. And there's not any kind of real purpose other than just to make sure you don't cheat. cheat. Yeah, that's right. Um, whereas you contrast it with somebody who's actually there and actually Invest. relational. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of how I framed it after we were done talking. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about uh, how our attitude towards God uh, is kind of the focus of this situation and that we've got two guys that have very different attitudes towards God. Um, I, I do have to use the P word here, pride. I've, I've, got to, I've got to believe that that is the reason why the Pharisee came and said, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like other men. Um, yeah, I read Ellen on this again this week. And You've got two guys, actually, that stand apart from the regular crowd. And they stand apart from the regular crowd for two different reasons. The Pharisee stands apart from the regular crowd because he believes that he is better. 
he is very, very aware of the fact that he is a grade or five better than everyone else. So he does not mix with other men. And he lists the kinds of things that he knows that his fellow uh, synagogue goers are doing. And then he adds in, or like that publican who is also there, who does not feel worthy enough to be with the rest because he knows very well who he is, and so he stands he stands apart. Um, so uh, something that, Jordan, we talked about this week was, was merit and... and uh, and sort of judging our own motives for why we do certain things. Um, I, I feel like we need, we need to constantly be aware of that. Yeah, and, and again, you guys are going to get real tired of, of me saying this, but for me it's, it's a day-by-day thing. And um, some days I, I'm a different place on that continuum than others, but... Mm-hmm. Um, we we also kind of talked about uh, service versus what's the word we used status. That's yes. what we used. Yes. And I may be beating you to a punchline here. No, not but, at all. Um, Good move. Our our involvement in this community and in, in the relationship with God is is to be. I think we're called to be of service um, to each other and to the to the larger communities that we're a part of, mm-hmm. and and it's. I think easy for that to transition to once you have that history of service to look at it as kind of a status thing as a part of your identity can be. And it's, it's an easy transition that I have to be mindful of um, because uh, when I was in college, they had every, every week they did a ministry for the homeless where they'd go into the city and they'd feed people and it was great. Mm -hmm. And I never did it, (laughs) which is maybe, maybe a a little too honest, but um, no, it was they always That's left so early on Saturday mornings, and I was sleeping. But you, you could always tell the people who were really regular about it because, like clockwork, on their Instagram, on their Facebook, whatever, they were talking about it. And there would be pictures of them with all the food in the back of the vans. And there's, you know, it, it'll, it chafed a little bit. Um, maybe part of that was because I felt like I should really be there helping. But part of it also for me was like, yeah, we get it. You're, you're providing a service. But how much of this is about you, you know, how much of it is right. about what you're, the people that you're supposedly serving versus you kind of building up your, your Jesus resume. Yes. Um, Jesus says something about the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, or when you pray, go into your closet. Right. So the, the whole balance between status and service here is, is, kind of highlighted for me when you look at the, the focus and the intent of the two characters in the story where one is very interested in making sure that his status is secure. Mm-hmm. He's done the work. He's built it up. Yes. He's, he's putting it all before God to get his stamp of approval. Yes. And for the other one, you know, there's, there's no pretense of status. Jesus intentionally used that kind of shocking he did. Uh, example because it, it strips any kind of... Uh, possibility of a, of a listener saying, well, he had this to hold on to. No, this guy had nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and for him, the, the thing that he seems to be seeking, in my mind, is, is something that's in service to the relationship mm-hmm. with God and to, and to make you know, that relationship right. Right. Well, we have, again, we have the story of the most famous tax collector in the Bible, Zacchaeus, and his reaction to Jesus calling him, literally calling him out, out of the tree, uh, calling him out of hiding, um, outing him, as it were, uh, in public, he comes up with the, you know, the way in which he is now going to act um, as a result of uh, the forgiveness uh, or, or, or the reinstatement that he is feeling that Jesus is offering him. Uh, maybe he hasn't been to synagogue in a long time. Maybe, maybe he's been too scared. Uh, uh, he 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 reacts. We think in a very weird way, but uh, what I've I've learned is that that he actually goes down the line of exactly how the Old Testament said that you are to say sorry. Uh, if you've stolen something, you're supposed to give back four times as much. So he says, I'm going to give back four times as much as I have stolen, and of of what's left, I'm going to give half of that to the poor. 
So people know that he is, he is literally stripping down to the bone and Jesus leaves and says, now this too is a child of Abraham. He's back in. He's, he's in the, 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 the clan, so to speak. Kind of coming full circle, we've, we've got the fact that you've got two guys who go to church, who go to synagogue, and they are there to meet with God. They would like to see him face to face. Um, and they would like to go away with his blessing. Stunner at the end. I mean, completely not what Jesus' listeners were. Eagles beating Patriots level of just <laughs> unexpected. Who knew? Who knew? Okay. <laughs> and weren't we so glad? No, anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not rigged. It's, it's <laughs> they ran out of money to pay the refs. Uh, so you, 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 you have, you have this, this stunning statement of Jesus at the end that the man who everybody knew was a sinner was, was not the one that they would have picked. He's the one who goes home. He's the one who goes home forgiven. Um, I don't know what... Uh, how, how does that how does that hit you with your own, with your own in, introspection in me uh, it seems to come down to how much self you bring to that conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and why you're bringing yourself to the conversation um, one thing that i it's it's almost like you're you're you know looking around for me like you're waiting for some kind of other shoe to fall, but in, in reading Jesus, he almost never does what I would expect him to do. Um, there's there's always some kind of twist or a surprise if if I'm really paying attention. It's like, man, that that wouldn't have been my reaction. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that goes back to for me. There's there's nothing like Jesus really here. Uh, that's maybe a bad way to say it, but. Here on this earth. Yeah, exactly. Yes, as a model. Right. And I would agree. And and so to, to see the way that we're supposed to be is is sometimes kind of, you know, jarring and counter to to what we're used to. So to see that this guy who had all his I's dotted and T's crossed is, mm -hmm. you know, not making it that day. Um I think that just reminds me that that there's two kind of measurements being used there's there's the human measurement mm -hmm. of success yes. and then there's the divine and um the only way i feel good about taking stock of that is by trying to maintain that connection to god and saying i hope you'll lead me where i need to be to be at the level of service that you had in mind for me um and to just try and not get in the way of myself um that's a that's a very very dangerous prayer to pray though, isn't it? Because it could be that God's going to point out something that you're pretty proud of, and and He might say, "I don't need that in you." I I I can actually say that that has that has been part of my experience. You you you, you think that you're pretty good at something, and then it just is not necessarily something that God is calling upon in your life. Yeah, uh, it's it's happened to me too, and it's it's like. It's not the greatest, but I think that for me, what's what's almost worse is being in that pride train for a couple of years and then coming out of it at the end for some reason and looking back and going, ooh, I spent a lot of time thinking that I was really good for doing right. this and right. then I wasn't. Right. And so I, in, in my life, I trust God to sort of um, head that off at the pass, you know, and keep me from making too big of a fool of myself, which I'm sure I still do anyway. I'm well, and you're saying a, a big of a fool in front of who? Um, in, in many respects, that is where the word focus comes back in for right. me, uh, making sure that, that we're uh, making sure we're square with the person whose thoughts about us matter the most. Right. Okay. So uh, I, I don't want to be to say what you just said in, in, in maybe a, a more distinct manner, I don't want to be foolish in front of God. I'm willing to be, in, in actual fact, you're also saying on the other side of that coin, I'm, I'm willing to be foolish 
in, in front of human beings. If, if, if that is what God wants me to do, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it, which is probably the motivation for why we don't do what God does sometimes, right. wants us to do, because like Jonah, it's, uh, every time I did that, God, it, it, it didn't work out the way that I had hoped it would work out, and I looked foolish. Mm-hmm. I honestly believe that's why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, because God never sent the fire. And look, he never did it in Nineveh either. So Jonah looks silly, and he doesn't want to look silly. So really, it's who you're judging yourself by or who your, 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 your leader is in some respects that I think makes the difference as to why we look foolish or who we're afraid of looking foolish in front of. Yeah. Because um, none of us wants to look foolish. Uh, but it's, it's really hard, I believe, in this world today to follow God because it is going to look foolish to other people. And I liked you choosing the Exodus verse for today because I think the important thing for me to keep in mind is that there is a, a true desire to see God and to be seen by God mm-hmm. by both examples in this story. Yes. And that's something I think we can all relate to. You want to be able to be in the presence of and be recognized by God because that's the that's the approval that ultimately matters. Yep. Val- but validation validation yep. yeah mm-hmm. and I, and i do think that you know the publican in the story was looking for validation as well mm-hmm. just from a different angle and for different reasons but that's the thing for me that that keeps me keeps me honest is that it's such a it's such a small relatively small shift that has to occur between the two mm-hmm. um they're actually more similar than we would think right mm-hmm. um and and if I walk out of here thinking that I've had this talk with you and, boy, thank goodness I'm aware of that now, I've got it covered, <laughs> it's going to be real easy for me to fall into that spot that sure. I probably shouldn't be. Sure. So I, I really appreciate the, the reminder that we're all looking for similar things here, I think. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, that keeps me from being too judgmental to people I might call weeds to do a callback to yes. you know, week one. Week one, that's right. Um, Love that. If some of you didn't hear that, the point that Jordan made was that maybe God, maybe Jesus says to let the weeds grow with the wheat because the possibility is still there because he does miraculous things that he can actually change a weed into wheat. And that if we go ahead and pull the weed out too soon, then they don't get the chance to be transformed into being a, a wheat, which I, I thought was, was wonderful. And that's that's what you're alluding to now. You're, you know, um, yeah. We we need we need to give ourselves the the opportunity to uh, be transformed by God. I like the word that you keep using, which is um, courage. Courage. Uh, I pray for it, and I want you to know that that you're welcome to pray for it as well. Uh, I ask God for the courage to follow Him, to say yes to what he wants. In other words, I, w- I need courage in this world today to continue to say yes to God every day. Because the thing that's going to happen, like you're saying, is we, we are going to want to go a particular direction because we don't want to look foolish. We, and, and so our, our focus is on those around us and what they might think. And so, I, yeah, I, I definitely need a lot of courage to be able to say, God, I'm going to make what you think of me today the most important thought that I have about myself. Um, and then when I do that, when you ask me to go do this thing today, and I think it looks silly to do that, I'm going to remind myself that I prayed for courage to just go ahead and do it anyway, because you said to do it. Uh, I think that's... Uh, it's a shift. It's a it's a shift that that we can all relate to, and that we can all work towards, so to speak. It's it is it is something that I don't think is going to happen. I'm going to give a shout out to Eric to say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we are going to need the Holy Spirit's power this week to have that courage. Um, he is the only source of that courage. We, we are not the source of that courage. So I'm not letting, you know, don't want anyone to walk away from this uh, time together thinking, I had the courage. 
And thank God I had, no. no. Uh, every, every step of this process, I believe, is, is a gift from God. It's by His grace that we have the courage to say yes to Him every day. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Next week, uh, let's see, what is it? I believe it's the talents. The talents, next week. The king and the three guys. That's the okay. official that's has the nothing official to do with title. five guys moving service or three guys pizza or whatever. <laughs> but it's it's the king and the three guys that he he entrusts with some of his wealth. Come and find out uh, what what we think about that. And just want to let you know that next month, uh, beginning two weeks from now, is a new emphasis, a new series that uh, I'm, I've stolen the title. Sorry, just going to. Give a shout out to, to the person who came up with it. The Upside Down Kingdom. I think a natural progression from what we're learning here right now is that it is not life as usual to be a follower of God today. And you are going to find that the measurements that are out there for individuals, maybe you already have found this, uh, are not the same measurements that God uses. And so if you want to know more about how God sets things up and uh, what he does in order to help us to live the life that he wants us to live, that's what we're going to be talking about in the, the Upside Down Kingdom next month. And uh, we, we hope you will uh, be here for that and enjoy it. Because like we've been talking about today, uh, this coming to church thing, I want you to know, uh, I will never feel bad if you don't come to church, I will feel sad. I will feel sorry for you, feel sad for you. But my next question is always going to be, but are you doing something that will invigorate and will fertilize your relationship with Jesus? Because if you're not here, then I'm hoping you're doing something else. Because more than anything... When Jesus comes back and we see him face to face like we all want to, I know that you and, and, and certainly Jordan and I, we would like to see the face of God and not die. That's, that's what he said, right, Exodus? Moses wanted to see the face of God and God said, no, if you see my face as a sinful human being, you will die. So I'm going to pass before you and I'm going to turn my back. You'll only see my back and I'm going to place my hand upon you and I'm going to push you down it, it, cleft. Is, isn't that something we only talk about when there's a facial problem? Okay. The crack in the rock. Now, did God crack the rock open that he was standing on and push him down into it? I don't know. But he puts his hand on him. He cracked... Moses gets to look through God's fingers and he sees his back go by. And as it goes by, God proclaims his glory to Moses. I don't think Moses ever stopped wanting to see God face to face. And I hope you and I hope I never stop wanting to see God face to face because I don't think the Pharisee cared he thought he had it in the bag and the publican he did not think he had it in the bag he knew he didn't and he knew that he needed God to forgive him and to make him right again and don't know where you find yourself on that continuum today but I'm hoping that you will never ever stop wanting to see God face to face Amen. That will require a change. In the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says, we will be changed. And that new body will be able to withstand the presence of God because it will be he who has created it and he who has perfected it. It will not be this body, it will not be this existence that stands in the presence of God, my friends, because we are all sinners in need of a merciful God. Jesus tells amazing stories, doesn't he? 
and uh, it's it is it is so much fun to to sit with Jordan and and to uh, to just rattle through these. You are welcome. You are welcome to do the same thing. Do not think that it's just us that can have this kind of fun. Uh, as a family, I suggest that you get around a, a story like this and see what your kids think. I, I bet you'll be surprised. I bet they will bring some insights to this situation that you have never thought of. Okay, And maybe it will be a wake-up call as to how your parenting is going. Because maybe they think of you like they think about God. Just FYI, just, just, just a hint, okay? You're in the place of God until somebody grows up enough to have their own relationship with God. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting thing to do. We want these guys to be able to sleep later tonight, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I, I'm basically wanting them to, to go home and say, God, I need you so much! Because <laughs> I, I know I do. I know I do. So blessings on you. May we enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Amen. Amen.